Hi, Ken. How are you? Hi. Uh, very well. How are you doing, Hoi? Uh, fine. Thank you. Are you. Ready for your presentation? I see that you have your presentation here, right? Uh, yeah, it's kind of early here, but hopefully. Yeah, we'll start uh, <laughs> on, on, on time. So we have uh, one minute and a half before your presentation, but I, it seems that everything is, is ready, but we will uh, try to, to keep the schedule so it will be easier to cut the videos and to prepare the presentations for after the conference. So where are you coming from? Uh, um, Boston, Massachusetts, USA. So it's the morning there, right? Yep, bright and early, 7.30. <laughs> you have to wake up earlier for this presentation. It's bit. almost <laughs> uh, Argentinian time, right? Or Yeah, it's maybe. only an hour different from you. So. Yeah. yeah. I'm lucky I'm not so on, like, I'm... on the West Coast, but it's like 4.30, so. <laughs> good, good, good. So we'll continue with the Pilot data. We have many presentations, and yesterday we have uh, also presentations about uh, COG uh, mm -hmm. uh, cloud optimization GOT files. Also, uh, the metadata raster file was very nice presentations about this subject. But we are on time, five seconds to to start. So I'll leave okay. the stage to you, Ken. Have a nice presentation. You can start. Thank you so much, Jorge. Um, and thanks, everyone, uh, who's able to join this this, this session. And thanks, Phosphor-G, for, for hosting this great conference. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about uh, data tiles, and specifically raster data tiles. I realize that my actual title for this was a little ambiguous, but this is focused entirely on, on rasters, which I feel are an underappreciated format for the big big data revolution. And just to give you um, a perspective of where I'm coming from, so I work for Sasaki. We're a big um, multinational, uh, multidisciplinary uh, design firm. Um, and so you know, everything we're looking at is really trying to understand cities and design and our impact of design uh, by understanding uh, you know, uh, natural and man-made systems, access and reach, who can get to what and how, and then development forces like market forces, and then how those impact design strategy and how design impacts markets, et cetera. And then we do a lot of um, communication of ideas and, and storytelling. And so we also use um, geospatial a lot for, um, for that. Um, but I just wanted to kind of reflect from our perspective, at least, um, on the current state of uh, geospatial. Um, and you know, in spite of so much great work in, in the open source community, we're seeing so much of that at this conference. We feel that you know, this, uh, it's still um, a field that's dominated by major players. Um, many of them are repackaging public data into paid platforms. We find that public data uh, can be hard to access. You know, there's lots of tools for browsing, previewing, um, but it's still really, really hard to get hold of. Oftentimes, downloads are really, really huge. But at the same time, uh, there's no real solutions right now um, that, that we're seeing that can really handle um, really large data sets. Um, we're talking about you know terabytes or even petabytes of, of data. Um, and then, you know, uh, when we are downloading these files, they tend to be discontiguous. You often have to deal with seams because you have to download multiple, because you, to, you tend to be at a, a join between the data sets. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, we, we see a lot of work, I think, in geospatial being repeated, that um, people download the same source data sets and then do a lot of the same operations on those data sets. Um, and there's no real way of sharing interim data right now. And then a lot of the web-based visualizations uh, are happening. You know, the rendering is actually happening on on the server. This can be, um, uh, you know, uh, for any kind of real-time dashboards. This often uses server-based uh, GPUs to to kind of render those. But all the all the rendering is happening on the server. And then it's kind of getting piped through the front end. And then vector data tiles have, have really taken off, um, but we feel they're not always the answer. So. Um, I wanted to just show um, one example of, of what I'm talking about. And this, this is kind of um, a really great data set if you're not familiar with it. Um, uh, so you know, Esri put together this uh, land cover data set using machine learning and a lot of really uh, interesting techniques. Um, but if you want to grab this data set, you have to go and grab a 60 gigabyte geotiff to get the whole, the whole planet. Um, you, uh, 
so you can also download individual boot tiles, and this is what I was talking about in terms of like you know often you'll end up a, at a at a seam or like you know this is kind of dis discontiguous data. Um, but uh, you know the way that you're actually able to browse this data, um, you can kind of zoom in dif different areas, and you can say, okay, I just want this 150 megabyte file. But what's kind of crazy is that they are actually serving this up um, from their backend as data tiles, and so they have this format called Lurk, very very um, Im impressive uh, compression. If you haven't looked into that, it's um, it's open source itself. Um, and I just want to mention, I, I have a, a lot of links to this presentation. Um, I don't know, Hoy, if you were able to post that that link in the chat. Um, but if anyone wants to follow these these links, I did post the presentation, so you, you can click through to some of these things. Um, but the uh, the lurk data itself is coming through as these six kilobyte tiles, and so this whole screen is you know, it's probably uh, less than a hundred k of, of data being loaded here, and then actually rendered on the client side. And so my question is, why we aren't just grabbing those lurk tiles and using them directly in our in our tools? And that you know, we also get this. You can literally have the you know entire planet kind of loaded in at at whatever scale you need. Um, so, um, in terms of what what's been happening with data tiles, I was just talking about those those lurks, and then kind of using that you know Ezra using those and pulling them directly into this this viewer. Um, probably the the most impressive data tile set that I've I've seen or worked with is the Mapsen ter Terrarium one. I think Mapbox has something very similar now. Where the entire planet um, is available at a fairly high high zoom, you know, so they have seventy trillion data points, which is starting to get into that big data space, um, and you know, you can browse those completely seamlessly in web browsers. There's some great tools like this on the Go map, where you can just draw um, draw a line across topography, and you can you can kind of see that topography, and that's all just being picked up directly from these data tiles. They don't actually have the um, the map based representation here. An example I found of that, uh, you can see this Sentinel Hub playground, but that one was very striking to me because you know you can see um, it's kind of a, a server-based example where they're pulling the data tile, but instead of bringing it through the front end, they're taking it through a server, doing a bunch of rendering. It tends to actually be kind of slow. Um, and I actually have some examples of something very similar in our Zaru platform, which we developed. Um, and uh, you know, so so you're able to actually take that same data and display it in in real time. Um, and then there's our GOPNG GOPNG DB format, um, and so that's our kind of take on on data tiles and you know how, how to uh, we we've added a few uh, features that that we like, um, but just to be clear, you know this is all about the the data, and then um, we're talking about like different tools for representing that data, but they're pretty much um, separate in terms of you know we can pull data from any source as long as we have the data tiles into different front end platforms. Um, so just to kind of highlight how how, that, how that's working, for example, in you know our little mockup in terms of what we're doing on the front end. So we're just rendering every tile individually. Uh, we take a elevation tile, we take an aspect tile, um, we pipe those through what we're calling Zaru, uh, where we're adding you know some settings for like how we want to color it, how we want to shade it, etc. Um, and then we're using uh, shaders to be able to do that very very fast on the front end. Just Tile by tile, but we can easily um, do you know, about thirty tiles uh, in real time. And then you know the the magic of of how how we get this to scale is really just using the magic of slippy maps. And so um, you know slippy maps are an incredible way of representing the entire planet down to like super super detailed level um, just through uh, those powers of um, four. So we you know each, each time you zoom into a tile, it's getting divided into four. Um, and then you know if you take those four tiles, they become these four tiles. You then zoom into another tile, um, and so you know you can do that. And it's kind of crazy how quickly those those numbers get really really big. And so it's a great solution for really uh, huge data sets. So you know some advantage of data tiles the way we're using. So what's great is that the data matches the web display perfectly. So pixel for pixel data and, and web display, we can get pixel perfect representation across scales. Uh, we can directly query and represent from the same source. Um, and then the queries can actually be multi-pixel aggregates, so that basically you know, you're know you not just looking at one, one lat long, but you can actually be looking at like a little area that can, can help um, kind of understand the, the data in that area. Um, and then what we found really exciting is this idea that you know numerous sources can actually be combined together just on the client side, and um, you, know, you can have novel discoveries through, for that. And then it's a great way of like taking interim data sets 
publishing them um, broadly, and so anybody can can use them. And so, you know, server side rendering certainly has its place, but um, we kind of feel like you know you're losing a lot of kind of important information uh, when you bring it to the the front end. Um, it requires more complex architecture. It can be expensive and difficult to maintain. Um, and then you know queries have to be really really complex and contain a lot of information, um, kind of that you're sending back and forth through the, to the, to the server. Um, and then we're seeing a lot of use of, of vector tiles, and you know vector tiles actually are just um, an, another form of data tile. And actually, it's exactly the same idea that you. What's been great about vector tiles is we're pulling them through to the front end as raw data. And then, you know, Mapbox and others have been doing great work to kind of take the GPU and be able to represent that vector data um, in really beautiful maps. And so it's been an amazing solution for cartography. Um, and, you know, I think will continue to be like a really important part of this picture. Um, but I've certainly found that, you know, even though it's amazing for cartography, it's not always the best for data visualization. Um, and something I've been noticing, for example, is what I'm calling vector rust. And that's where the vector line work is getting um, kind of, uh, it's it, it's getting to the point where it's starting to be very, very small and hard to represent, especially when you have multiple different different parcels. Sometimes these things actually start to get sub-pixel. And so you just start to lose information when, when dealing with, with vectors. And there's no good way to really represent that. And you also can't zoom out to the whole planet with detailed uh, vector information. It's just too much data to bring to the, the front end. And so the raster solution is very, very simple, just using that slippy map methodology. Uh, we can actually get pixel perfect representation so that every pixel, even at kind of zoom zero planet scale, knows exactly what is represented and underneath it. And we simply do that by we would render um, high, you know, even if you're starting with vector data, we render at the high resolution. And then we just do pyramid summing the whole way up. So you know these four add up to 10, and that gets represented in the, t in the one pixel above them. These four add up to 29, that gets represented in the one pixel. And we can just go up that, that giant tree of the slippy map tiles. Um, and then another comparison, you know, in terms of being able to query with, with, with data tiles, um, I just was using the Google Time Zone API recently and um, decided to get rid of that and replace it with, with data tile requests. Um, but you know, it's very, very simple. Feed in lat, lat long, get back time zone information. Um, it's five dollars per thousand requests, which maybe doesn't sound that bad. But if you have thousands of users and you're doing, um, you know, and you you want to do something real time and kind of or, you know, just uh, um, let let people kind of do something very interactive, um, that's going to add up pretty quickly. Um, so the equivalent of querying a tile from S3 is that number there. So just to kind of wrap your head around that, you know, five dollars of S3 queries would run you um, sixty-two thousand um, dollar Google API bill. So it's a lot cheaper to kind of query tiles from something like um, S3 or any other kind of static hosting. Um, and then the other thing is if you are doing mouse over queries, you're not actually having to request a tile for every pixel. You're, you're requesting um, 65,000 odd um, pixels at a time. So what we've actually made, so uh, we have a, a GOPNG DB um, format spec, which um, is on GitHub. So there's kind of a basic specification and a record lookup specification. I'll get into that in a second. Um, we have uh, a few utilities for processing uh, different formats into, in, into this. A QGIS plugin, which is still um, kind of under development, but we've used in a couple of projects. And then Zara, which I definitely encourage checking out. Um, give a presentation on that on, on Wednesday. But that's our front end visualization tool. And I'll give a couple of examples just to so, show how we can use GOP and GDB. So the basic specification is, is pretty straightforward. Um, we just have some metadata. Uh, there are a few uh, data types that we, we support, just integer, decimal, and, and text. Um, and then uh, the precision variable basically lets us convert between integer and decimal. The variable pre precision goes a little further. It allows us to change the precision based on the zoom level. So when you really zoomed out, your numbers can get really large. Um, if you're at you know, zoom level zero, for example. But as you zoom in, the, the same precision may not work. So you can just have more precision as, as you zoom in through that solution. Um, and then we also support arrays. So if you have similar kind of data sets, um, uh, we can array them. Actually, it's just, it just makes larger tiles and essentially arrays them across. 
Um, so just an example of, of, of how this, this looks. So um, we, you know, we're able to pull in data tiles and then use them directly for visualization as well as um, querying in, um, in front end tools. Um, and so uh, for example, I have uh, this data tile here is showing population density. Um, it's actually um, in this particular example, it's showing um, uh, the white population, but the same tiles are actually an array and they um, uh, contain uh, all the different races in the US census. Um, and then I have another data tile set that I'm pulling in, which is walking distance from parks. Um, again, there's a few different kind of uh, layers on that one. And what I'm able to do is combine those together and I'll show a quick demo of, of that. Um, and so this uh, this map here, just using kind of a dot density representation, looking at that race map, so that all of that is being pulled directly from the tiles. You can kind of see the tiles loading at the edges. It's pretty fast. You um, probably not able to catch it, um, but you could probably just see some of the tiles loading. So those are slipping map tiles loaded on demand. As I zoom in, same thing. We're getting more resolution here. And as I mouse around, you can see it's doing that area query I was talking about. So everything in, within that circle is kind of being reported in that box at the top. Um, and so it's just telling me the total pe number of people um, and the different racial breakdown of the people within within that. Um, and then I'm able to also add um, these isochrones to start looking at. Um, so if we're talking about walking no more than 10 minutes, or, you know, so this is just, again, you can start to see the rasterization of those tiles because I didn't do them in a super high resolution, but it's kind of helpful to see how, how that's kind of playing out. And so, um, and this is coming from Conveil's R5 tool, um, doing all these isochrone analyses as, as rasters across a group too. Um, and so what this tool is actually trying to do is, um, is show us uh, kind of uh, who has access to parks and, and who doesn't and, and some of the kind of characteristics of, of those people. Um, and what's happening, you know, just under the hood there, as I'm moving that circle around is it's just um, kind of taking um, the image and I can be, be doing that across tiles too. Um, and it's just uh, essentially querying all of those those pixels within that image, summing them across the, the different arrays. Um, and then the other um, piece that we've developed is a tool for um, doing record level queries. And this one's a little more complicated. Um, I think I only have um, about five minutes left here, but I'm gonna move fairly quickly through this. But I just wanna quickly show the, the demo of that in action so you can kind of get a sense of that. So I can zoom out. So this is every um, parcel in Massachusetts. I can zoom out and start to um, you know, filter all of those records. And this is all happening actually in real time, completely on my um, uh, local GPU. Um, and so you know, we're actually able to come in here and like um, do real time queries in you know, 60 frames a second across 2.5 million records. And so the way we're doing that is so the data looks something like this, you know, 2.5 million records. That's what they look like when they're arrayed in a, in a big image. Each pixel is actually contain, contains uh, data for a couple of fields, uh, things like home value, which is what I was kind of inspecting there as we, as we move that around, um, things like the actual land use of the parcel. Um, and so basically for the, the spatial uh, record lookup, each field is saved as one of these images. Um, we again supporting text and engine and, and, and float types, um, and uh, yeah. So each each of these images kind of gets loaded on demand as needed. Um, and the way that that relates to the spatial tiles, so that um, basically it's that same that same idea that we are. Um, if you imagine each of these dots is a is a point record for those parcels, different types. Um, as we kind of move up and down that um, that scale, we are. Um, just aggregating those points. So, you know, all the points un under that pixel end up under that pixel, and then under that pixel, et cetera. So again, we get that kind of perfect, pixel perfect record representation. And then as you can imagine, you end up with a lot of records under particular pe pixels. So we kind of have to have an array representation of those. Um, and so, you know, if you imagine the spatial points falling on the grid, uh, we're basically, um, you know, looking up um, particular indices within that data image. So this is just the pure record data. So one point for every record. This is essentially the, the slipping map pixels and this is the relationship between them. Um, and all we need to be able to move between those is this idea of kind of a start and stop index in an array. So we just know which chunk of this image to kind of scan and grab those values from. Um, and then one kind of interesting innovation here was just um, 
being able to reuse the same image across different zoom levels, we just use a kind of nested indexing here, which makes sure that we always have um, the, uh, you know, we, we can kind of uh, use a, a start and stop range across the different zoom levels, and it just kind of scales up. So a couple of lim limitations. Uh, it's definitely not a replacement for, for vector tiles. We feel it's definitely a complementary technology. Um, another thing is uh, always worth bearing in mind is that you know EPSG four three two six kind of looks like this in terms of you know these circles are all the same area, and obviously there's a lot of variation by by latitude, um, and so um, you know there are just some things you have to kind of bear in mind when when working with 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 pixels and areas and um, you know things like density. So. So yeah, in terms of um, where we want to be going next, uh, you know, we're continuing to develop this, uh, and uh, you know, we've been seeing a little bit of movement, like with Esri, but not as much in the open data space. I'd love to hear um, from from you if uh, if you know of anyone else doing anything with with data tiles um, in open data and open source. Um, it'd be great to get a standard schema with a lot of these features. We you know we put this together kind of um, uh, as a way to get the ball rolling. I think. And then, you know, obviously standardized tools and plugins and, and those kind of things, platforms for, for sharing. And then I just wanted to um, end off with this kind of slide, which, you know, I think it um, just kind of showing maybe it's a little bit of a, a pipe dream for where I'd love to see us um, end up with, with, with data tiles. But, you know, as, as I see things kind of the, the way it plays out right now is like, you know, we have um, desktop GIS where, you, you know, you have a lot of power and flexibility, but things can be very time consuming. So each of the dots here is just representing data from a different source. And obviously, GIS professionals have all sorts of sources. You can go through ArcGIS or QGIS or, you know, a bunch of different uh, web-based formats. And then, all, you know, you're pulling those into these kind of tools and, you know, you have enormous power and flexibility, obviously, through those toolkits. But it's not always um, easy to use for you know people who are kind of planners, designers, decision makers, um, and they also have access to um, a bunch of tools um, online. They tend to be really simple, easy to use. Um, but uh, you know, with server-based tools, development or kind of um, uh, you know mashups or hacking on those things can be can be difficult. But you know, so, so for example, if, you know, if you want to understand what's what's happening um, with uh, temperature rise and soil temperatures, as well as how that relates to like potentially vulnerable populations. Uh, I'd have to go to like three different websites, um, and so our vision is, you know, what what if everyone was just starting to store all of those information as raw um, data tiles? What would that mean in terms of being able to access that? So the idea is that we could be developing different client side tools, um, which are. Um, you know, they, those are feature distinct, not data distinct, like these ones are. Um, and so, you know, you'll be able to draw from any of these different different resources, pull them together in kind of novel ways uh, within within your your front end tools. Um, and then, you know, obviously that would there'd be a relationship with that and deeper dives um, through like desktop JS or other web JS platforms. So, thanks everyone. Yes. Uh, so, um, if anyone's in, interested in this or um, helping out or, or just learning more, uh, please check out the, the repo and, and, and demos. There are a lot of links um, within this, this presentation. Uh, please star the repo. If, if you like it, spread the word on social media. And then probably the best way to con connect would just be via a GitHub issue if it's specific to GOP and GDB. Um, I also have some contact information here if you want to want to connect, as well as links to a couple of the other presentations I've been giving at Phosphor-G. And just want to um, shout out to this the Saki team, Eric, Kai, and Ali Khan, um, who've been helping push this, um, and a bunch of open source projects which we've we've used. And that's that. I'm open to questions. Oh, it was an amazing presentation, Ken. I was really impressed and really impressed with the the, the smooth and the, the performance of of the client. Really amazing. We, we have Thank some you. questions. Uh, one is is uh, related to the, the comparison with GeoTIFF. Can you say something about how this compares sure. with the GeoTIFF? Sure. Yeah, and actually, on, on the repo, I actually have like a little section where, I, I, um, you know, I'm, I'm no expert on, on on GeoTIFF or Cogs or any of these other technologies, but as much as I can kind of understand. Um, so GeoTIFF, I mean, and you can actually absolutely serve GeoTIFF tiles. Um, so uh, you know, GeoTIFF. 
tend to be um, m most cases, you know, you're downloading much larger areas, lot, much larger areas. Like in that example that I showed with the, the Esri tool, you know, you can download that 150 uh, megabyte GeoTIFF, and then, you know, you can take that into your, um, your desktop tool and combine it with other GeoTIFFs and start to analyze it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's absolutely compatible for sure. Um, and we could be pulling, absolutely be pulling GeoTIFF tiles uh, into the browser. Um, in most use cases, that could be replaced by something like Lurk, which would just be much, much better compression than, than GeoTIFF. Um, but the other, the other advantage of, of using PNG, and I actually should mention this, is particularly on the, um, on the side of the representation, a tool like, like Zara is we're pulling those PNG uh, files directly onto the client and then straight through to the GPU without having to do any pixel-based processing. If we're working on the client side with GeoTIFF, it's just a bit slower because we have to be, um, th there's no native interpretation within the browser. And so that is one of the reasons that, that we're using PNG is that it's um, it's natively supported by all browsers and very very fast. Okay, and uh, an another question may I, may I put the question in context? What is your workflow? You edit the data in QGIS. The data is prepared in QGIS and, and write in Geo PNG DB format from QGIS. Yes, basically, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. Um, it, it depends on the source. I mean, uh, some some of the data sets that I was showing there, um, we've been processing from from uh, other sources. But if, if we have the data in something like QGIS, then yeah, we that's where our QGIS plugin lets us basically just export those values into into this this format. Um, yeah, and we also have users asking if this plugin is available. Uh, uh, it's 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 not in in the. Um, it's not available through the the QGIS interface or anything. We haven't really published it. It's not um, it's not quite of a, uh, a sufficient quality at the moment. I think to be to be placed in there, um, but the uh, the the instructions are, um, are are linked on on the repo in terms of how you can you can add it and then, and, and install it. Okay. No, if it is available, uh, users can can install it. Although it's mm -hmm. not in the official repository. Yeah. Um, uh, another question is: Is the the best use cases to use this uh, GPNG instead of of other solutions? Uh, can you? Yeah, and it's, not, it's certainly not a replacement for for everything. I mean, just to kind of be clear, I mean, I think it's 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 really valuable for kind of um, discovery and kind of being able to mash up dif different data sets. Um, it's currently limited in the browser in terms of what we can do with like raster processing, you know, things like um, buffering, uh, et cetera, would need to be kind of done up, up front or other kinds of raster, raster processes um, rather than the browser typically. Um, but, you know, the idea is to be able to, um, uh, at a pixel level, you, you, we can be at least combining, you know, s saying like, is this within this, uh, you know, so essentially like point and polygon, those kind of operations are very, very easy to do with, with rasters directly in the browser. Um, as well as any kind of, um, you know, any any kind of basic um, compositing of raster information, we can we can do directly in the browser in real time. Okay, we have one question more related to the support for three D data. Uh, is is this format able to support a, a dimension for three D? Um, it's no. I mean, it's it's currently. I mean, except for like. Uh, height data or kind of lidar data and, and that kind of thing, which is essentially uh, 2D. Um, I mean, I think there's, there's other good good solutions for for doing any kind of actual uh, 3D representation of, of things. So this is this 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 is really focused on on on, on 2D data and, and just that slipping map grid. Okay. One one last question related to the GDAL. Uh, are you thinking about uh, having this support in GDAL? It would be very nice. Yeah, that's an excellent su suggestion. We haven't we haven't looked at, at GDAL, but um, yeah, it, it would definitely make make sense as, as as this matures for it to be part of that pipeline. Yeah, it's the Swiss knife for all file formats, so yeah. it would be nice and it'd be. So Ken, thank you very much for your presentation and for being here to to answer all these questions.